Welcome back. In this video, we'll take a look at some common types of morphemes that can attach to nouns. There's many of them, and there's no possible way we can cover them all in Intro to Linguistics. However, I do want to review some of the major types of morphemes that you will find accompanying nouns. For example, nouns usually have number. Uh, nouns can be singular or plural. Nouns sometimes have case which is a little morpheme that tells you the function of the noun in the sentence, whether the noun is the subject, the direct object, and so forth. Finally, languages can group their nouns into different classes. For example, you might find that nouns are grammatically masculine or grammatically feminine or grammatically neuter. So let's start with number. In many languages, you have numbers like singular and plural to distinguish between one of the noun and many of the noun. For example, in English, we have the morpheme S, which uh, can make the difference between one student and many students. This is the singular or the plural. In some languages, there's no number. Japanese has some way to mark, plur mark plurality, but there's no unified morpheme that can tell you that there's many of something. For example, in the sentence, gakusei ga koko ni imasu. Imasu means to exist or to be. Koko ni means here. Ga is the subject. And gakusei is a word that can mean one student or many students, depending on the context. So this sentence can mean the student is here, but also the students are here. So there's languages that use singular and plural. There's languages that don't make any number distinctions. And there's languages that make more number distinctions. For example, Maori has a number that we're going to call the dual. In Maori, you can say kia ora koe, hello you one person, kia ora koto, hello you all more than two people, but there's also kiora korua, hello you two, so there's two people that you're talking to. Likewise in Arabic we have the singular and the plural, kitab and kutub, for book and books, but you can also have the dual kitaban, and this word means two books. In the language manam from Papua New Guinea we have the singular and the plural, so ngara means that woman, ngaradi means those women, but we also have the dual number, ngaradiaru, those two women, and we have ngaradiato, those few women. So there's a difference between one woman, two women, a few women, and many women, which we use the plural for. So as you can see, some languages have no morphemes for number, and some languages have quite a few morphemes for number for the nouns. Let's look at case. In many sentences, I'm sorry, many languages, there are morphemes that tell you what is the function of a noun in a sentence. For example, Russian has six cases. The nominative tells you that a word is the subject of the sentence, as in Anna Tansuyet, Anna dances. She is doing the action of dancing. The accusative tells you the direct object who the action is being done to. So Anu, as in Ya Viju Anu, is I see. Anna. Anna is the one being seen. The genitive case tells you that something belongs to Anna or is of Anna, as in karandash ane, the pencil of Anna. The dative case is for something that benefits Anna or is given to Anna, as in ane, dayu karandash ane, I give the pencil to Anna. The instrumental is used to mean that you're doing something with Anna, uh, as in yatansuyu sanai. I dance with Anna. The prepositional is used for when something, when you're talking about something, when you are doing something out of place. So, for example, ya pishu abaini, I write about Anna, has the prepositional. So, as you can see, you have the root of the noun and then a morpheme that's called case that tells you what that noun is doing in the sentence. Finally, nouns are usually divided into different classes. If you have only a few of these, like two or three, we usually call that grammatical gender, like having a grammatical masculine or grammatical feminine or grammatical neuter. If you have quite a few of them, you we call this noun classes. For example, Swahili has 18 ways to split nouns. And if there's many classes and they uh, refer to the shape of the object or some characteristic of the object, we call those classifiers. Let's look at them one at a time. In many languages that you might have studied, uh, words are arbitrarily assigned to a gender. For example, in German, you can have der Tisch, the table. 
die Gabel, the fork, or das Bild, the picture. And these are masculine, feminine, and neuter. And of course, there's nothing that inherent that makes a table inherently masculine or a fork inherently feminine. These genders are assigned at in, in an arbitrary way, which is what makes them so difficult to memorize when you're studying them. There's really no association between a word and the gender that it gets. In many languages, you have genders that mass like masculine and feminine, but you can have other ones. For example, in Swedish, the genders are common and neuter, as in tomaten, the tomato, and applet, the apple. These are common and neuter gender, and you can see that they have markings on the nouns. I want to make this very clear. Grammatical gender is not biological sex, and there's even though there's some overlap between biological characteristics and grammatical gender, these, the overlap is very little. In Spanish, for example, uh, we have the grammatical masculine and feminine. And if there is a biological being that could be described as having uh, sex for your gender, for example, we could have el gato to describe a masculine cat and la gata to describe a female cat because these beings could be described with biological properties. However, there is, in most of the nouns, there is no association between the grammatical gender and whether uh, the noun could be described as feminine or masculine. As you can see here in these pairs, ojo, hoja, foco, foca, masa, maso, brasa, brazo, casa, caso, plata, plato. Um, these words, don't have anything that makes them masculine or feminine. Like there's nothing inherently feminine about uh, an ember, for example. There's nothing inherently masculine about a case or about a plate. These genders are assigned in an arbitrary way. By the way, in week seven, week eight, uh, the social linguistic week, we'll study um, something completely different, which is trying to make uh, gendered languages like Spanish gender neutral for humans, uh, which is not a structural topic, but a sociolinguistic. Let's continue with structure for now. So if you have few classes, we usually call those gender. If there's many classes, they're usually called noun classes. In Swahili, for example, you can split nouns in 18 different ways. So for example, class one and two have words with, pref with the prefixes m for the singular and wa for the plural, as in mtu and watu, person, people. In classes five and six, the singular is uh, done with the prefix g, and the mass and the plural is with the prefix ma, gicho, macho, i, eyes. And again, there's no reason why something would go into class five or into class one other than it just is. They were arbitrarily assigned, just like grammatical gender. And there's languages that use words to describe the shape of objects. For example, in Japanese, the noun itself doesn't have a, a classification morpheme, but if you want to count the noun, as in one dog or one car or one pencil, you need to, to say a specific form of the word one. For example, inu ipiki is one small animal of dog. Kuduma ichidai is one machine of car. Uh, Sashin ichimai is one flat sheet of photo and you need to count like this. You can't just say one photo. So each noun has its assigned classifier, and you need to memorize these as you're learning the language. Classifiers are fairly common. Um, Chinese and Vietnamese have classifiers. Many languages in the Americas have them. Indigenous languages, um, American Sign Language uses classifiers. Here we have an example for Bribri. From Bribri, for example, butterflies are flat, as in qua qua et, one flat object of butterfly. Uh, alligators are long, tarok etum. Children are people, ara, ara ekur. And years are round because they sort of go back on themselves, duas ik. So as you can see, there's many, there's uh, some types of morphemes that usually accompany nouns. Nouns are usually accompanied by number to tell whether it's singular, plural, and so forth. Nouns can come accompanied by case to tell us their function in a sentence whether nominative or accusative, and some languages split their nouns into arbitrary categories. So uh, when we have few categories, we usually call that gender. 
when there's quite a few of them, like in Swahili with 18 classes, we call this noun classes. And if a noun needs to be accompanied by a certain word that describes its shape or characteristics, we call that classifiers. In the next video, we'll look at common morphemes that go with verbs.